present John and Grant, and I'll let you follow up with your own bio. Very How good. Wonderful you are. <laughs> what? No, no. <laughs> Thank you, Nadine. Um, I was happy to say yes to Nadine. I've known Nadine for many years, and she called me and asked me to give a talk. It was just after the flood, and she said, hey, I'm giving a, a, a seminar or a educational event to teachers, and we're going to talk about, you know, after the flood. So, you know, we had been talking a lot about sediment and the flood and impacts to the St. Louis River estuary and the Duluth area. So, I, you know, I started thinking about, you know, sediment in the St. Louis River estuary, and I got back to her and said, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to, I'd love to give that talk about the St. Louis River estuary. But I, I changed it, I changed the, the talk from, I can't remember what it was, good sediment, bad sediment, to, to uh, sediment in the St. Louis River estuary, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because I'll, I'll admit to my age, I'm 52, and uh, my kids tell me I, I don't act my age, and I tell them that's a compliment, that I don't act my age. And uh, so, but being 52, I, I was growing up right at the apex of, of westerns, you know. So I, I was a big western kid with the hat and the gun and the running around shooting people. And, and uh, so I, I know... Only bad guys, right? <laughs> only bad guys. So, um, yeah. So I know this is a, a terribly overused euphemism, but good, the bad, and ugly. It really applies to, to, uh, to sediment when it comes to, to rivers because it's not cut and dry, you know. And, and I heard somebody say, is there, is there a right answer? I think you said that. Is there a right answer when you, were, when you were looking at the stream? And a lot of times there isn't a right answer when it comes to stream geomorphology. It, it really varies whether sediment is good, sediment's bad. So... Uh, Hopefully we'll, we'll answer some of those questions here. And then the other thing was, this was called the story after the storm. And I started to think bigger that, you know, when you're talking the storm, you're talking uh, June 2012. But really, I work with the St. Louis River Estuary. And the storm for the St. Louis River Estuary started in about 1880. Mm -hmm. And the storm lasted for about 100 years. Mm -hmm. So the storm for the St. Louis River estuary was a lot of different things, not just the flood of 2012. Of course, the flood of 2012 was a dramatic thing, and, and the impacts of that kind of play into what they were teaching you out here in the, in the room there. So we'll talk about some of those things. So the, the, I'm going to do three things. I'll, I'll talk about the place that we'll talk about, and then I'll talk a little bit about the history, and then I'll talk about uh, uh, some of these things you just learned the different kinds of sediment and, and how the sediment impacts the St. Louis River estuary and how in some ways it can be good, some ways it can be bad, in some ways it can be ugly. All right, so this is the big picture. Uh, my job is, I work for the Minnesota DNR. Uh, I'm a fish squeezer by profession, by education, but I've graduated into this deal where I don't touch fish as much anymore. I'm an AOC program coordinator, and an, air, an AOC is a Great Lakes area of concern. There's 43 of them all around the Great Lakes. These are areas that, that have been impacted or impaired by human activity, and the St. Louis River right here is, is one of those areas. And I am the St. Louis River AOC program coordinator for the Minnesota DNR. So I've got the best job in the DNR. I get to work with all the folks in Duluth and I don't know how familiar you are with Duluth and, and the people that live there, but we have a lot of uh, eggheads in Duluth. There's just a lot of um, scientist types. There's the EPA lab, there's three universities, there's NRI, there's uh, Wisconsin DNR, Minnesota DNR, Bowser. There's just a huge number of people that, that are educated and work on this kind of thing. And, and I get to have a nexus with almost everybody and work toward cleaning up the St. Louis River estuary. So this is the Great Lakes. These are all the AOCs. We're at the very head of the lakes, and I always argue that at, in, at the national scene, that you, know, you really should clean the top of the table before you, you, know, you clean the floor. So let's, let's focus our money on cleaning up the St. Louis River estuary before we clean down here where everything is heavily impaired all around. So, all right, so that's the Great Lakes. This is homing even in, in a little bit closer. This is the... Uh, you know, most of the St. Louis River estuary, and there's some statistics here, and uh, you'll see the St. Louis River drains 3,634 square miles of northeast Minnesota. Uh, it's the headwaters of the Great Lakes, like I just said. Uh, the lower 21 miles right here is a 12,000 acre estuary, and it's the largest estuary in Lake Superior. It's the most productive piece of water in Lake Superior, which 
doesn't take a whole lot because Lake Superior is not a real productive place, but it is a, it is a, a very productive uh, uh, estuary. So we have 45 game fish species that live in the estuary or live in Lake Superior and migrate in and out of the estuary. So it's really important for fish species, some of them uh, like lake sturgeon, walleye, longnose sucker, they utilize this area up at the head of the estuary for, for primary spawning areas for, for their population. So we have 230 bird species identified. And the reason is you look at Lake Superior, birds coming down from the north hit Lake Superior and they migrate along the, the shore of Lake Superior. So it's kind of a funneling action of, of birds into the, into the estuary. Question? I'm sorry, just clarification. You said those are 45 native game fish species? Game fish species. Yeah, there's, there's 45 native fish species. There's a lot more um, that are exotic or introduced. But you said, did you say game fish? Well, yeah, game fish species, yeah. There's more species of cyprinids and all the other stuff. Uh, no, 45 native fish species. And that, but there are several other uh, exotic species. So, and that brings me, if you have a question, raise your hand. I like to ask, let's answer questions as we go rather than wait until the end. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Um, largest, and this is huge. This is the largest freshwater shipping port in North America. And we've been that for, for a long time. So the estuary is very beautiful, but we have to remember that it's an active shipping port. And a lot of people in Northeast Minnesota make their living by working on things that, that are on, in professions that are generated by stuff that comes in and out of the estuary. So, and then we have two, 250,000 people that live within 20 miles of the estuary. All right, so there's a picture uh, a little closer in. As you can see, we have a, uh, a lot of folks that live close to the, close to the river. All right, so the history part. Uh, 150 year, years of impairments resulting from economic development in Northeast Minnesota and Northwest Wisconsin. Okay, that starts with, you know, you look at this picture, what, what jumps out at you when you're looking at this picture? This is some an artist's rendition looking kind of up the estuary. What do you see about this picture that's that's odd compared to today. There's no trees. <laughs> There's no trees. And that's what you would have saw. If you came to the estuary in, like, in the year 1900, you wouldn't have seen any trees on the hillside. They were all gone. So you look at you know, what you were talking about, about watersheds. The most dramatic thing you can do is cut down the trees in a watershed because you're talking about flow, velocity, uh, that really changes the stream channel of a stream, or the channel of a stream when you cut down all the trees. There's no, there's no transpiration, there's no roots sucking up water, the hydrology increases, erosion starts to degrade the streams. So all that stuff started to happen 150 years ago. So even streams that look normal now, if you look historically, you can see that bench of the, the, the historical um, first bench of the stream, but that probably changed 100 years ago. And then the stream, boom, as soon as we cut all the trees, boom, they degrade. And then they find a new, they find a new equilibrium. So um, the first thing we did is cut all the trees. And you know, that, that went on for 20, 30 years, from about 1880s up to you know, the 19-teens. Next thing we did after we cut the trees is we went up on the iron range and found the most, uh, probably the most pure uh, vein of, of iron ore in the world. And we proceeded to, to set up steel making and, and all sorts of other industries. So we were the, the shipbuilding uh, center, a very strong shipbuilding area f during World War II. So a lot, of, a lot of steel industry things popped up. Now you're talking sedimentation, a little bit of sediment coming off the U.S. steel site there. Huh? So if you, know, you all know where U.S. steel is, out in Morgan Park, it's in western Duluth, up, up the river. So this is the Morgan Park US steel, U.S. Steel site, and this is Morgan Park. So we're working to clean that up right now. So we have, and then, so that's the kind of stuff prior to the Clean Water Act that you have pouring into the St. Louis River estuary. So these are, you know, th these are not very good sediments. You know, it's not something you want to wash your hair in, I don't think. So you got a lot of that, you got a lot of that. You know, you ever swim in the tot lot? You bring your kids to the tot lot on Park Point? 
I don't think too many mothers are down at the top lot with their kids swimming on a day like this. So, I mean, this is sediment. These are, these are contaminated, nasty sediments coming out of the, of the St. Louis River estuary. And this isn't so long ago. This is 1973 I, that this photo was taken. Well, yeah, and raw sewage was probably the, the good stuff. They were, raw human sewage would have been a good thing relative to some of the other things they were dumping. And they weren't dumping sewage into the lake. They were dumping it into the pool. Well, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It was flowing through the, through the river, right? I mean, because people wouldn't go near the river back then. Yep. Like, it was like you couldn't give property away. No, and that's, you know, you talk about the the benefits people talk about you know you tree huggers i can't believe you want to waste all this money on cleaning things up well the honest to god truth is the great lakes the economy of the great lakes is turning around now because we're cleaning things up people moved away from these areas uh 50 years ago now they're moving back you know the 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 price of of real estate along the st louis river estuary after wlssd came online you know it, it skyrocketed instead of moving away from the estuary people move back and they want to they want to recreate there all right, so here's Will Munger. He's poking a stick in a motor on Morgan Park, and that's some sediment there. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot of nasty stuff floating on the estuary. All right, of course, that has uh, impacts. You know, you, you, you kill off all your fish. So by the end of, you know, by the, by the 40s and 50s, there were very few fish species, fish left in the estuary. We had driven most of them into, into extirpation. So you had to be a fish that was pretty, pretty uh, resistant to, uh, to contamination to survive. All right, so the last thing we did, not the last thing, another thing that we did, because it started actually pretty early, is that we put dams in the river. We put eight dams on the St. Louis River watershed, and that was to fuel Thompson Hydro, uh, was the first hydroelectric facility, and these dams up at the head, you know, the ones at Rice Lake, Fish Lake, Island, Boulder, and Whiteface, were to hold back water so they could generate power for the folks that, that lived in Duluth and Superior. So, uh, I guess I didn't hear you talk about it too much today, but what does a dam do to a river? I mean, as far as sediment goes, what, what influence does a dam have? A lot of that sediment just builds up behind the dam. Really yeah. Yeah, because I mean, a river, the whole point of a river is to move sediment. You know, you may think it's to move water, but really the whole point of a river is to move sediment, not water. So water wants to have sediment. It has to have sediment in it. If it doesn't have sediment, it's going to get sediment from somewhere. So if you put a dam in the way and all the sediment settles out, the first thing that the water is going to do is to try to get more sediment when it goes over that dam. And if there's no sediment in the water, it has to get it, and that means it's going to erode. So you get heavy erosion behind dams because it's, it's trying to get more sediment into it. So you get heavy erosion behind dams. And you don't get natural sediment flow because of the dams. I just have a quick question. Have any yep. of those dam, dams under the Have they been removed? No, not on the St. Louis River system. But we're, you know, uh, um, you know, the, uh, uh, for, a lot of dam, there's a lot of dam removal going on in the United States, which is good. There's a lot of dams that are unnecessary and, and we're taking dams out that, that aren't necessary. It's going to be pretty hard, I think, to take out these dams in the, in the St. Louis system. There's a lot of people that live on the reservoirs around them. They're not going to be too happy if we say we're going to drain Island, Island Reservoir. And it hasn't been so dramatic in the St. Louis system because the upper part of the estuary isn't a real sediment-laden system. It's kind of a bog system, not a whole lot of sediments. So now I'm going to just talk a little bit about fluvial geomorphology, just because I like to say that word. <laughs> um, and, but I, this isn't going to be a heavy science talk. And because you, you learned about this stuff, stream erosion and deposition, whether streams erode or deposit sediment is controlled by velocity, slope, and discharge. So th those are the, the energies that are going on or the, the physical variables that control whether it's going to erode or whether it's going to deposit. And that you can see the balance here, this lane's balance of alluvial channels. If everything is balanced straight up and down, you've got a stream channel, um, it's not it's not e-graded, it's not degraded. Water rises, it spreads the sediment out onto the floodplain when it rises in the spring or in a rain, then it comes back in and 
keeps doing that and you know it's everything's balanced you know as soon as you put it out of balance you either you either get too much sediment so that the stream can't find a channel or you degrade and the stream can't get into its floodplain anymore to, to relieve the power so it just keeps digging deeper and deeper so there, there, if you get things out of balance which is pretty common these days uh, it's hard the stream has to find a balance again so this is what exactly what you guys just learned you know fast means erode slow means deposit friction with banks slows water uh, exact same things you learn you get depositional bars here and you get cut banks uh, on the outside all right that's all the science on the picture so, uh, so what's up with sediment in the st louis river estuary so i'm an optimist so we'll start with the ugly We'll talk about the ugly first and we'll work toward the good. Um, all right, just a one, one plug for the environmental side is that everything changed for the St. Louis River Estuary after the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972. And I fear now, 40, what is that, 50 years later? 40 years later. 40 years later, 40 plus years later, um, we just assume that the water's clean and that everything is good and that we don't have to focus on these things anymore. And there, there is a push afoot to make the argument that we can't afford these regulations anymore. They're costing us jobs, they're costing us the economy. And it's, it's been very, uh, there's been a very insidious but well-developed message that, that we can't afford things like the Clean Water Act and, and to clean up our water or keep our water clean anymore. So I would just caution that we should be we should be we should be vigilant about that because a lot of folks gave their blood sweat and tears to to pass the clean water act and it just didn't cut prior to 1972 that it, things were not good and since then things just get progressively better but it, it doesn't have to stay that way it can start getting it can start going the other direction so wlssd western lake superior sanitary district came online and uh because of that we took these point sources and some of these places closed so these contaminated sediments that that come down down the estuary they, they don't do that anymore they're they're processed and they're through WLSSD so you can imagine what these kinds of sediments do you know to to the estuary and we have three active Superfund sites in the St. Louis River that was the U.S. Steel site um, this was the Interlake Superfund site I worked on with other folks to clean this up over the last 20 years and we just finished that two years ago i don't know if oh you know what super fund stand there the super fund act it was another act where we could identify responsible parties that had polluted an area you could there was a process by which you could go out and say you need to clean this up so it's called the super fund act so um there's a whole complex of, of rules and regulations and this was a superfund site so the interlake superfund site was cleaned up and we finished it about two years ago so and the other one we have is the uh is the uh, hog island site and that drained murphy oil so murphy oil drained a lot of a lot of nasty things it came down newton creek and into the, this this embayment behind by barkers in, in the barkers barkers islands over here so um that produces these these industrial activities produce contaminated sediments and uh, these are nasty things you don't want to be swimming around contaminated sediments they get up into the food chain from the inverts that are eaten by small fish or eaten by birds so you you have uh, you have food chain or food web impacts uh, and they they tend to be persistent they don't go away uh, you'd like to think they're going to be covered up, but in the St. Louis River estuary, after 40 years, a lot of these things were still exposed, still getting brought up into the food chain. All right, so this is just a couple pictures. It was, this was Stryker Bay, which is on the St. Louis River estuary, and this was on the shore in front of the, it was called the 48-inch outfall. They had a, how big is 48 inches? They had a pipe 48 inches wide that for 30 years it just dumped tar into the into the St. Louis River estuary so the sediments were like eight feet thick of, of tar on the bottom of, of this bay and so that was constantly just boiling up sheens floating away so what was the source of that? it was the Interlake Tar Company so 
So they, they made tar and Dom Tar, another company called Dom Tar and Honeywell was the other responsible party. But the Interlake company took the primary role of, of negotiating in, in the Superfund process. So they, they made tar. I mean, tar was a, a product. So the byproduct of whatever they did to make tar, they just dumped into the estuary. All right, so um, this was that same, same, same spot. This is the shoreline that you were looking at right there by the 48 inch outfall. So we remediated that spot and I wish I had a, a slide here a year later because we remediated it, we restored it, we put uh, eight inches of, of clean sediments on top of this and six inches of clean sediments in the, in the estuary on top of the areas that were, where it was either removed or capped under five feet of sand and a, and a filter barrier. And now it's all grass and trees and, and starting to, and now we have a, a 200 foot buffer. On the other side is the Western Waterfront Trail. We'd like to connect up the Western Waterfront Trail to this shoreline. There's a 200 feet of, of buffer strip that the Minnesota DNR has easement on. And then you can go across and over to, to the Grassy Point area. All right, so this is another, remember the Carnegie building that was on the point out there? They've taken it down now, it was the big, there was a big, huge building out on, the, on Grassy Point. It was called the Carnegie Building. Well, that's it right there. I just use it as a, as a landmark. This was a big tar pit that was on the peninsula on the other side of the slip from, from, uh, from the Interlake Superfund site. So this is the same spot right there after, after it was remediated. They capped a bunch of sediments going out. They retextured the hill. And uh, now that's all growing up and in, in been replanted in native, native soils or native, native plants. All right, so that's the ugly, contaminated sediments. We pretty much, we're still working on a, on a few sites. Uh, the U.S. Steel site, and there's a, a couple that don't have responsible parties. We're trying to deal with the sediments in those uh, without having, we're trying to deal with them through the Great Lakes Legacy Act. And we also have money through Minnesota dedicated funding. So we're starting the process to clean these areas up also. All right, so what did I say, the bad. All right, the bad, there's, there's two things. There's organic sediment and then there's, there's uh, mineral sediments. And organic sediments was the thing that I talked about right away. The first thing we did when we came here is we cut down all of the trees. So here's a, here's a statistic from 1894. In 1894, these are all the sawmills in the St. Louis River Estuary in 1894. They'd float the logs, they'd cut all the trees in the watershed, float them down the St. Louis River in the spring freshet, and then gather up each of the logs. The packs of logs would have brands on them. So they'd pull them into their sawmill here. The, the company would grab their logs and they would mill them right on the shore, out on the water, cut them up, put the sawdust and the slab wood right into, into, the, into the estuary, you know, not, not use it because there was no market for it. So look at that number. 343 million board feet of lumber was, was shipped out of the Duluth port in 1894. I mean, that's a lot of wood to be, and all that wood goes out, not all that, a lot of that wood goes out into the prairies to build, build barns because they got no wood on the prairies, so you, you, you use our wood here in northern Minnesota. But that's ambitious. You know, you see these, they romantically talk about it on Venture North, but I mean, it's amazing how, how fast they cut the forest in northern Minnesota. And, and with no, yeah, it's just astounding how, how fast they did that. So here's, here's pictures of these guys floating the logs down the, and you talk about sediment. That's, that's sediment, that's a piece of sediment, the tree is. So you can imagine what that piece of sediment is doing as all that mass is chugging down the river. So the cutting of that, that sawdust, it all ended up in the... Well, yeah, it all ends up in the, in the estuary. So it comes down, floats down the river, cut them up, cut them up in the, in, the, uh, in the estuary. And this is a bay we're working on right now. It's called Radio Tower Bay by, by the city of Gary New Duluth. You know where the Oliver Bridge is? The, the road goes over to Oliver. This is just as you look down, as you're going to Oliver, look down to the right, you can see these radio towers. This is called Radio Tower Bay. The whole bay, there were two sawmills out in this bay at that time, and then they burned down in 1918, but they'd already done most of their work by then. So the whole bay is, bottom of the bay is covered with slab wood, uh, sawdust, and this doesn't grow, question? So John, those logs are from 100 years ago? Yeah. So, and what was cool is you, you can't see, the first phase of the project, we got uh, $800,000 to clean this, the first phase of this project. 
And there was a, a railroad trestle that went out because they had a railroad that went out to their, their mail site. So there were all these pilings. So the first phase, we pulled these, these, um, these pilings that were part of the railroad trestle. So they had been put in place in 1885. So they put in place, they're, usually they use tamarack because that's very resistant to rotting. So they drive these tamarack trees down into the, into the ground. And so we pulled these, these, these uh, pilings out last winter. And there were 600, no, there were 400 and some of them. And I mean, they're big, they're huge, like this big. And that's a big tamarack tree. So you think they were put in the ground in 1880. So that tamarack tree is probably 150 years old. So that tamarack tree that we were pulling out of the ground was probably, you know, a seedling in, you know, do the math, in the mid-1700s. So, so anyway, we pulled, those, the, we pulled those pilings out, and now we're, we're using the rest of the money uh, from, that, from that grant to do the feasibility study uh, for removing all this wood waste. And, and what we hope we're going to do is we're going to grind it up and hydraulically pump it up to the U.S. Superfund site. There's 120,000. Let me see. I'll go to the next. Oh, this is about. This is Grassy Point, another place where uh, Pat Collins did some work about 15 years ago, and this was wood waste too. Uh, and this is uh, well, me when I was young, <laughs> and wear goofy glasses. And uh, this is sawdust. So the whole. This is Grassy Point. So this whole. This whole shoreline is just for way out is just full of, I call it coffee ground bay, coffee ground flats, because it's like coffee grounds and nothing grows in it. Um, so we're going to remove these coffee grounds and those are sediments. So we got to remove these kinds of sediments. All right, so, all right, keep going. So that's, that's what we're going to do ultimately in Radio Tower Bay. We're going to, there's different modules and we're going to, we looked at how much wood waste is in each module. And then this is the volume. So we've got about 117,000 cubic yards of wood waste that we're going to, that we're going to actually, um, yeah, of wood waste that we're, we're going to remove. And it's going to cost about three, three to four million dollars to, to restore that bay and bring it back to healthy biological function. Because you do not have healthy biological function when the whole bay is covered with wood waste. Uh, it just doesn't grow plants. It doesn't have inverts. So it doesn't have fish. So we're going to restore this bay uh, next summer. We have money from Outdoor Heritage Fund, Cindy. Just a quick question: uh, What shape are the tamaracks in when you pull them up? Really good, and it, they did they, get, did they get saved? Yeah, they're in a they're in a uh, in a, a gravel pit up toward up the Bex Road, and we're going to use them to make a walkway. Hopefully, when we're done, so we'll, we'll use that tamarack to, to do some kind of walkway out into the bay to, for an interpretive kind of deal, and then have then tell the story of the law, the sawmill and the and the radio towers. What, what was the pH of that water? The, the, the coffee ground water. My guess is the pH would be pretty low. You know, it, it'd probably be in a five or to six kind of thing. So we, we're going to get money. There's a good chance we're going to get money from, from NOAA because they funded the first phase. And, uh, I would guess that they're going to fund the second phase. So hopefully we'll do that next summer. So it's not, it's not cheap to, to clean up after all of, the, all of the impacts that we had. So this is Grassy Point <clears throat> downstream quite a ways. And this, we just did the concept plan for this. And we're doing the feasibility study. We got a grant from the Fish and Wildlife Service to do the feasibility study and the environmental review. And this is going to have about 500,000 cubic yards of material in Grassy Point, because there were way more uh, milling went on in, in this Grassy Point area. There's already a trail out here. If you're familiar with it, you park right here, and you can go out to this spot right here. And I have a question, because in other places, the migration of that stuff is a real issue. But it sounds like it doesn't move much. It doesn't move much. It hasn't, no. It, no it, it's kind of good, isn't it? Yeah, it is kind of good, because, well, I think when they were doing it, the wind and waves would move it around. So on the other side of the bay over here, there's a fair amount of wind. But you know how the wind goes. It's generally northeast uh, on the bay, and that's this direction. So most of the wood waste, even in, in Radio Tower Bay, you know, most of the wood waste is piled up over on this side. You know, most of the wood got, got piled up here, and plus the mills were. There was a mill here and a, and a mill here. So yeah, yeah, that'll make it easier. this side of the bay from here, over to here, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to, it's this area right here that we're going to remediate. Right here, that we're going to restore. All right, so 
that's uh, organic sediment, which you don't normally think of and you didn't talk about, but that's, that's the kind of sediment that impacts uh, the St. Louis River estuary. All right, so we'll talk about the Duluth, the, the flood. You know, this is the water coming down the hill really fast, velocity, velocity high. Um, that's what happens when it settles out. You know, you're dropping your little chips <laughs> in the St. Louis River estuary. So that's, that's sediment. Uh, yeah, that's, this is Spirit Island right here. So that's a lot of sediment in the St. Louis River estuary. But the estuary is, is used to sediment because it has the Wisconsin, you look at Glacier Lake Superior, it was you know, a, a whole flat over on the Wisconsin side. So it's all a lot of clay over there. So you have uh, the Namaji, you've got Pokagama, you've got Little Pokagama, you've got Red River. These are clay influence things that come in. So it's not uncommon to have you know, a little color, but this was pretty amazing that we had that much, uh, that much stuff come into the estuary. All right, so, but, so that, the sediment itself can be detrimental to covering up spawning habitat for fish. Uh, so there, there's short term and there's long term, and I'll talk about that. It, this, this is the area, you know where Spirit Mountain is? The base of Spirit Mountain, Knowlton Creek, comes down through Spirit Mountain, and it empties right here. Um, this was a picture in 1961. You know, so this is a shallow sheltered bay behind, behind Talus Island, that's called. And this is the mouth of Knowlton Creek in 1961. So 1972, Spirit Mountain comes on the landscape and we all love to ski. I know Ann loves to ski, I love to ski. And not to the fault of Spirit Mountain because no regulator said you have to have some kind of plan to, to deal with your sediment and your flow. Um, they just got a permit and, and built the ski hill. But you can imagine what happens on a steep hill with water coming down, it transports sediment. So this is, this is that area in 2008, a mere 40 years later. Um, you've got, this is the mouth right here where you're looking at. So when you look back at, at that, look at this, this, this feature right here. And you look, you look that's this feature right here. So this whole bay had converted, these are trees. The bay had converted to trees. This had become a, a marsh. In about three or four more years, this whole thing would have filled in. And this whole highly productive shelter bay would have converted to a, to a marsh in an upland. So I mean, in an estuary, marshes are, are very important for, for fish production. So you don't want that to happen. So I mean, there's, there's uh, long and short term impacts to mineral sediments coming down. I mean, you can have clay cover up spawning beds, and then you can have large flushes of, of sediment uh, actually fill in habitat, fill in bays. And this is happening at other bays. Kingsbury Bay, same thing is happening. Uh, so the, the mouths of these streams coming down the hill are depositing sediment into the bay at a very unnatural rate. So we got to think, figure out how we're going to deal with that. Hey, John. Yep. Yeah, well in fact, we'll tie those two together because uh, if you remember the picture of the Interlake, Interlake Superfund site, um, they, you go way back then I guess, quickly go back, oh, 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 no, back to the picture, come on, come on, this area right here. This used to be water right here in the blue, but when they remediated, they blocked this off and they converted this to upland. And that's, that's this picture, that's this picture right here. This area got converted. So whenever you convert something from water to land, you have to mitigate for that. So the, in that process, we made the Superfund people uh, complete a compensatory mitigation project, and that project was Talus Island. So we looked at this, and I said, "Hey, look, you know, Talus Island. We've converted this to a to an upland. So you need to go back here, and you need to re you need to restore this area back to a uh, an open water setting, a shallow sheltered bay." So they spent five million dollars to do this. So they they took they took uh, this was their plan that Interlake. You can see. Service Engineering was their contractor. Um, 
This was the plan and the contours we had them follow. So this is what we had them create back behind Talis Island. So we had them restore the shallow sheltered bay. So again, you know, three, four million dollars to restore Radio Tower Bay, five million dollars to restore Talis Island. I mean, these things aren't cheap to deal with sediment that we unnaturally pump into the system because we're messing around with the watersheds. So we pump this stuff. Um, and if you, if you go onto Google Earth, everybody likes Google Earth, go on Google Earth and focus in on this area. You can see, because it's, the picture's taken at the exact same time we were doing this project. So you can see the pipe. They put two miles of pipe. They have a dredge, dredger that goes, well, yeah, we'll show you. All right, so here's the, here's the pipe. These are 50 gallon drums, these white things. So we had then, this is the area, this is that, again, this is that, that area, the thing I told you to focus on. This is coming around that corner, and then back into this bay, and then around this corner, gouged out this, and then they dredged, dredged this out. So this is their, their hydraulic pump. And this is two miles of pipe that's going along the river and spewing that out, this organic material, because it's, it still has seeds in it from 50 years of being deposited. We, we deposited six inches of organic sediment all over the Superfund site so that it would grow, you know, it would grow good, good aquatic vegetation. Um, so I've joked with people that, because I, I am a kid, and my, it, it, that my job now is just moving sand around the sandbox. <laughs> and it's so fun. So, so Talis Island is now an island. Yes, Talis Island is now an island. And it, it wasn't an island because there's a, there's a go, an opening here. They 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 made an opening here, and there's an opening here, so you can take your kayak back here. And there's wild rice starting to come in, and there's uh, vegetation. That be, and that's the amazing thing is that this sediment had been in that marsh area for 30 some years. So we just took it out. We didn't restore it at all. And the aquatic vegetation started to come back, and even even wild rice started to. So there was wild rice seed in that sediment that had been deposited over the years and it germinated after being you know, dormant in the sediment for 30 to 40 years that wild rice uh, germinated. What so, is Spirit Mountain doing now with the sediment? Good question. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect segue. So, okay, you're talking carts and horses? Definitely put the cart before the horse to go clean out the, we cleaned out the sink before we cleaned out the pipe. So, so we, uh, and having realized that, I went, oh shit. <laughs> so, oh that's right, we're being filmed, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's on YouTube. <laughs> oh, oh shoot. <laughs> So okay, so we're sitting here with a five million dollar investment at the at the mouth of Spirit Mountain, and on Knowlton Creek. So what are we going to do? So I I go to a meeting and talk to Renee Matson, who's the, the executive director. And Renee, lo and behold, wants to put a pipe in the bottom. They get they get water from uh, from the city, you know, chlorinated water to make snow, which makes about no sense. Uh, so they want to get a pipe to put a pipe and a pump right here, go through Talis Island. She was come, she's coming to me to say, John, can, I, you know, can we get a, pipe, a, a permit from DNR to put a pipe across Talis Island and pump water out of the estuary? Well, that's good, but you need to partner with me and we need to figure out how to, how to control your, your, uh, your water coming down the hill. Question? Actually, my instructor gave you five minutes. Five minutes? No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Talk fast. Um, so we spent, we got $600,000 to plan this whole project with the Corps, Corps of Engineers. So we're going to, we're going to fix the, the flow coming, we're going to fix the water, we're going to put a control structures at the bottom. And we're going to stop that water from coming down. We're going to capture the peak flows. We're going to put it down the same pipe that they're using to suck water up from the river. We're going to put that water in a big, huge collection pond. We're going to pump that water down through that same pipe. And then we're going to restore the stream channel so it's no longer degraded and moving sediment into the St. Louis River estuary. So if this all works, within four years, we should have this all buttoned up. And we'll stop the sediment from coming down. So I went too fast on Tuesday, and now I'm going too slow. All right, so the good, the best for last. Sediment deposits, 
Sediments of mineral, deposits of mineral sediments maintain critical spawning habitat, the emergent wetland features of the estuary. So, here's those dam thing. You know, we put dams in the river, stop sediments. Sediments good because it, it maintains features like point bars. Here's post flood right below the St. Saint, Saint Louis, uh, Louis River estuary. I don't know right below the Fond du Lac Dam. I don't know how many people have been below the Fond du Lac Dam, but there were 60,000 cubic yards of, of uh, cubic feet per second of water coming over that dam, barreling into this 90 degree corner. <laughs> this used to be relatively steep right there, but massive amounts of sediment came off this cut bank. And not just little stuff, big massive boulders. And, and uh, so that's the cut bank. That, and that was a good example of uh, of a cut bank. This is the next corner down. So this is the depositional plane from, from that cut bank. And this isn't sand. This is, this is stuff like this and like this that got to, went downstream and got deposited. This was the old shoreline right here. So this is good though because this is the primary spawning grounds for walleyes, lake sturgeon, long-nosed suckers, smallmouth bass. Um, this gravel is, is, is a good thing for that. I mean, it's a good thing for spawning activity in this part of the river. This is the downstream side of that, that same point bar. And this is just a little further downstream by Spirit, or by uh, Chambers Grove. Here's the bridge at 23. A lot of material, heavy, a little less heavy, but fairly heavy in its own right. You know, stuff like this was deposited down here, blocked off this channel. The channel deepened right here, coming around this corner. So it used to be a really riffly area. Now the, the, the channel, the water gouged out a channel in there. So this would all be really good for me to capture spawning walleyes uh, next year with, with our electrofishing boat. All right, so you go further downstream to Spirit Lake. That's when the energy starts to dissipate a little bit. It's carrying more sand down there. This is a, a bar around, if you know Spirit Lake, this is the herding map from 1863. You can see that there was a huge point bar all the way around Spirit Lake. And that kind of isolated Spirit Lake, made it a sheltered bay. Um, but what Karen Grand from UMD figures happened is put the dam in the river, stop sediment from coming down, and slowly that point bar starts to disappear. So here's some uh, aerial photos, 1939. You can see that it's broken open here. This, you know, this, this had already after, I mean, that's actually quite a long time. It's already 70 years after 1863. That starts to diminish. 1848, it's less. Eight, 19, or eight, 1948, 1961, wow. that point bar features almost gone. So the whole dynamics of Spirit Lake are changing because that point bar doesn't have enough sand to, to, uh, to maintain itself. So, we just figured out a concept plan for this area and hopefully we can work together with the U.S. Steel Superfund process to, to maybe restore some, some of this kind of thing. So same kind of thing happens. This is in North Bay, just upstream of Boy Scout Landing. This is also a, a point bar that goes around a bay. This is after the flood. This was emergent cattail stuff. Sand was deposited three, four feet deep around in, in this area. So it was a point bar energy dropping chips and these are all the chips that got dropped out it, it deposited all that material and helped maintain that that all that's new sand which i think everything all oh, it's a disaster but i think that new sand coming down in the system was it's a great thing to inject this sand into the system so same thing up up by uh water street up by rask bay up by fond du lac you can see how that point bar around around rask bay there's a big point bar that comes all the way around there. It actually built that, built that out with sand. Is so this, flood or what flood? this is from the, this, uh, from our flood in, in 2012. Both, both those last two things were from the 2012 flood that deposited sand and helped maintain those features. So, so, uh, so also, so the last thing, it, the organic material, that's, that's, uh, sediments coming down, which are good. Sand keeps, maintains those point bars. And then also stuff comes down trees and that's also very good spawning habitat for fish and, and shelter. Trees coming down into the, into the estuary. So this is looking up at that obnoxious uh, lodge you just put on top of Montalac and then a big bank sloughed down and that's all nice, nice tree habitat. And then there's an, a, another sheltered bay where a big bank sloughed in. And that also is good tree habitat or good fish habitat behind the trees. And this is in Spirit Lake where all, and just one quick story because I had a, a gill net set on the east shore of Spirit Island the night before the storm. And um, I went out there two days later and 
if you know where Spirit Lake is in relation to the estuary, is, is the upstream of Spirit uh, Lake is most kind of river. So a lot of energy coming down. In fact, I put in at, at Munger Landing, came out to Spirit Lake, and I look in the lake, I go, what is that? And these are navigational buoys in Spirit Lake. They have 3,000 pound anchors on the bottom of them. So you're talking energy to move, uh, move some sediment. The, the river moved 3,000 pound anchors. There were 15 of them deposited in Spirit Lake. So from upstream, from marking the channel. If you're familiar with the estuary, they're channel markers. Yeah, so the, cor the, Army, the, the Coast Guard had to come grab their markers and put them back up where they belonged. So I said, I bet you we won't find our gillnet because I had like a three pound anchor on the bottom of my gillnet. 